three all stars. I, I love the fact that one of them's corner back and two of them are in corner forward. It's a bit like Pat Fox in the hurling, although I don't think he has the honour of winning them in both the forward and the back line. Uh, it probably feels like a long time ago now, 1979, but uh, do you remember your debut? Oh, I definitely do. Uh, 1976. Uh, I played in the 75 76 league uh, for Monaghan, but my championship team was in the 1970s. Uh, 76 right half back uh, against Throne in Dungannon. Brendan Donnelly was my marker. A bad experience that uh, <laughs> Paddy Kerr, great Paddy Kerr, one and all Ireland at UCD. And uh, he says, You're all right, you're marking a big slow man, you have no problems at all. After 15 minutes of going two points, it doesn't be long time now he's big and slow. So I was I was moved to the forwards, and the great John, John Joe Gorman was. Um, Playing right three quarter, and as I was passing up John Joe, he was moving back wing half. I said, John Joe, have moved me up the strength in the forwards. And he says, You're a copy of her. <laughs> that was my debut at them and the championship against Tyrone. And um, these days, no, you're you're commentating with Northern Sound. Are you are you enjoying doing that? Yes, um, I, I enjoy it for a reason. Uh, number one, the players point, the players focus on it, and number two, I, be, I call it as a see it. There's a uh, yeah, people protecting different players. You have sports writers don't like to analyze games or be critical. Uh, the great thing I have, and there's no, and the players know it themselves. I call it as I see it. Even my own son was playing in the championship, and it was a, a bad night in in and It was really a well wintry night in the semi final of playing that. And he took a ball into the tackle, and he happened to come up along the sideline. And it was a real wet night, and he, I turned around and says, I told him not to take the ball into the tackle. Kieran, I thought, and a free kick, a goal came off it. So we lost it that night. So he always said that to me, and, and my family said that he's a bit hard. But um, I had spectators afterwards, relatives of, of players, and saying, You're very hard. But I call it to see it, and when people are there, they can see it. So when they get home, and the people ask them at home, Well, was it that bad? Oh, yeah, yeah, he was. Oh, he missed a clinker. So, yeah, it's honestly, I enjoy it. And at least it's there for the time being, as long as I'm able to do it, I'm very honoured to be able to do it. And did, how did your son find out that you had made that comment? He heard me because he was actually slipping in front of me. We were doing it like a sideline. And he was, he, no, he actually, it was his family, family tackle me afterwards. He actually was sliding to the ball. And J.P. Graham, it was my co-commentator at the time, J.P. was entering the ISIS. There's Kieran Hughes coming up with the ball and he goes into a tackle and he loses the ball. And of course, when you're 10 yards away and you can hear this, and the first thing he looks up when he loses the ball and all he can see is me with the mic. So it was a, a day to remember. That's the one good thing about it. Oh, that's brilliant. What I wanted to ask you is, what was it like growing up um, in Monaghan? I'm not sure the exact day of your birth. And you said yourself... I was born in 1957 and a family of 14 in a two bedroom house. Yeah, in was it seven brothers and seven, or was, well, seven, yeah. seven, boys, seven boys, seven girls. And um, Thomas and Thomas and Jared played football, and Patsy played uh, hurling. Uh, I had a sister, Eleanor, that was really, and Joan played camogie but, uh, and, and football, but Eleanor was really the outstanding player of all the family. She was absolutely. Unreal. She would have been a Gooch with an Ocean McCombell and a Declan Lockman for Monum. She steel class and could finish everything. She was a brilliant athlete all round. And um, ladies, she played with Armagh. But we uh, we were playing competitive football all the time because we were we were commons. There was 28 premises on the street and 14 of them. Uh, there was 84 kids in the street and, and all together. And then you take 14 of them, there's 14 houses without any uh, kids, there are 14 businesses, and the other 14, one had no child. And might take mommy, the 14 off that, there's 70 the next 10, uh, 12 houses. So it was a busy street, and we had a commons, which was all gravel, uh, about 60 yards long, but about 30 yards wide. And every day we played football up in the commons, and there weren't uh, some of your modern day players now we had plastic sandals and there's no socks so when the pebble went in between your, your toes you were bleeding for a while but you couldn't leave the field because it was amazing because it was just uh, the way it was that time and a ball 
it wasn't the soft balls you have now. You weren't getting the ball every day. It was a one ball had to do you. And it was great time. And it was all football. And when a neighbour came into the house, the first thing the neighbour came in, he'd run straight out the door because mummy would be, be giving chores to do. And uh, my father was a carpenter. And he'd take home these nails from St. Mary's Hospital to a rebuild in St. Mary's Hospital. And uh, they'd take home the two-inch nail, the three-inch, the four-inch, the six-inch. And we'd just straighten them out in a real cold days. So the minute the neighbour came in, I'd be coming in for a cup of tea. The minute we seen a neighbour come in, we're straight out through the door because mummy wouldn't miss you. <laughs> until and then you get a, a slap on the back say that even for not having all the nails done but it was a great time for growing up uh, we had a, a street league at the time and I was very small but nimble and very active and uh, we and my brother Thomas was the captain of the Tornadoes and I think it was about nine when he won the, the medal and the street league medal and it was a serious crowd of, they did a couple of hundred for a street league and let me say, sometimes the ball was secondary as long as you got hit in first. And you made sure avoiding the tackles was the main thing. Oh, but it was a great time to go on up. Oh, I'd imagine that. I mean, that must have been the making of you out there because there's no, there's no quarter aster given in those sort of games, especially, you know, local area. People are actually going out and killing each other. Well, it's the, the amazing thing, it's the area you're brought up in. And when you, when you look at it, when you went to school, it was a... Uh, it was a class, we weren't allowed to play football at the school. There was actually no footballs. But we, there was garage, Joe Cummins' garage was across the street from the National, from the Bachelor's School. And we used to take the pint can of oil, the plastic pint can, make sure it was well, lifted, and then kick it round. And then whoever stood in it got the daylights kicked of him because his ankles would be black and blue from start to finish. That was the start of actually a river dance because there was that much hopping on the line. It was fantastic. But it's was a serious time to play and, and then when you look at it, the football it hardened you in every way they, they compare players now to air time and it's wrong because the, it's a different era because mm. you know the way at the moment all conversation in life is all about COVID-19 I mean you can't really talk to anyone without that framing conversation that's just the way it is at the moment and you know you're from a border county and I think when you were a young guy you said born in 1959 the troubles were on. Was it, was it similar then in the sense that everything was framed within the context of conversations about that? Or, or did, did it kind of, did you feel that as a youngster? Could you feel that that was around? We did, uh, particularly, uh, I was traveling up and down a bit to Dublin and there's no question about it, uh, Shane. But the four you went up from me that passed on to Dublin, the troubles meant nothing to the west of Ireland. It meant nothing. People were immune to it. Uh, along the border we were, um, as you had Tony Scullion on, and, and Tony was saying, those times were very hard. Now, we were uh, very active along the South Armagh border, so there was plenty of checkpoints. And uh, I had a few bad experiences and um, some good experiences too, but uh, there's no question it was, it was tough. And there was a fear. Uh, when the troubles around the mid late 70s, uh, there was a lot of shootings along the border and I remember the embassy was going very well at the dance hall and it was a Sunday night and that time dances were from uh, you had to be in from half ten and no drink at the dance at the embassy it was just minerals and you were very good you do you want a cup of tea and a sandwich you take fancy the girl and she, she heard sandwich or a weird you did, and that was it but after the dance after the dance the cars used to queue up to go back across the border so there's no one to be individual, there wouldn't be no car on its own. So it could be 10 or 12 cars and they'd all drive the key. And that's the way that went home by convoy. So, because uh, there were single singleizing uh, individuals and uh, the young people, and they're all, we're all only 18, 19. And the thing about it was, you know, the fear was in us at that time. And we got to 21, the troubles were still active. It wasn't a nice time, but it kept you very alert. and. We were used to it all along, along the border. Anyone, Donegal, Fermanagh, Cavan, Monaghan, we were well used to uh, being delayed and hassled, and we expected checkpoints. And that was the way, that was the way of the world at that time. And thankfully, he's got it's it's over. And were there ever times where you were trying to almost conceal the fact that you were a GA man? You know, having GA gear, the you know the obvious emblems on your GA gear. Would you be almost trying to hide that? 
There would be times, uh, you would, there's no question. I'm a, a one good Friday, we went up for a few drinks to, to um, cross Midland, and I remember the soldier stopping us. And, and he, I was driving the car, and he turned around, and he says, Where are you going? I says, I haven't a clue. I'm following that car in front. All I know was told to go for a few pints, and that was it. But I was doing a presentation down to Colin McAlarney's team in Castle Wellman uh, around the 20th of December, uh, um, right a few years, was about the mid 80s. And there was, uh, an, uh, there was an explosion, there was soldiers killed. And uh, I was down a bit a day later doing the presentation in Castle Wellman, and it was yeah, it was around 10 o'clock. Uh, the presentation was at nine, but I was heading back to Monaghan and uh, I'd done the presentation a whole lot. And it was about half ten, I was leaving the premises at the club. And Colin, Mr. Best Luck, and said, Sam Brannigan had invited me down, so I said, I'll, I'll see you again. Because I'd be used to talking to Colin at the time. And uh, I was heading back up the road, and next thing I was pulled in. And uh, I lost about a stone weight in about 10 minutes uh, on the checkpoint. I had a rough experience, a bad experience. So I give them a, uh, what way I was, what way you going home? I said, by Dundalk, but I went by Camla and up by Cross Midland. Whatever chance I had of going through Cross, I'd be safe. Going up the other way, you were open target. Um, but that's, that's how worrying it was. And it really was a frightening experience. One of the worst experiences I ever, I ever had. And uh, I had a few in Belfast. Uh, when I was working with actually the brewery Bass Brewers. And uh, I would be up and down the Belfast all the time. I took a wrong turn. And uh, the area that I was going into was a real uh, opposite side, unionist area. But it just you, but lucky enough, I got out. And a person said to me, don't go up any further. If you go around that turn, you'll knock it back out. And thankfully, I met that person. So those were, uh, mm -hmm. I catch a moment for myself. But the good thing about it is it's a learning process. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, because I was trying to think of, you know, things that happened in Monaghan during the 80s. And of course, there was the Dublin Monaghan bombings in 74 that happened very quickly, one after the other. The Castle Blaney bombing in 75, the Hillcrest bombing, which was obviously in Tyrone. But, you know, that's probably not all that far away, less than an hour away. That, that Castle Blaney bombing in 75, do you recall that as a young man? I recall it very well. I was in uh, one of the site, or local site at home. Uh, uh, Castlevania News has the, the picture. Uh, Mary Byrne keeps them all updated. It's brilliant uh, for the local community. I was actually uh, about six doors up from my own house, but the bomb was off. was about 300 yards from my own house because I went down to the end of the street and they turned right to where the bomb was, which was only about 75 yards. But I was with John McQuaid, a uh, good friend. We grew up together on York Street. His McQuaid shop, Jimmy McQuaid shop. And I was in the house with John. And we could hear the explosion. But we didn't know what it was because this was the first ever in Castlevania. And we remember just going out and all we seen was smoke coming down. So we run down to the corner and the people were stopping us as we went. Instead of me turning right, we couldn't turn right because the people, smoke was coming. There was fire. But the people had stopped us from going. And you're only talking a matter of within 10 minutes. We got out, we looked, and we were standing there in the morning of amazement, not knowing what was happening. And then we run down, and we were stopped from going right. We observed it from the middle of the road. Uh, it's a T-junction in Castlevania. You turn right for the north and turn left for Monaghan. And uh, we've got Katy right and left for Monaghan. And we were standing in the middle of the road because there was no traffic having to come to a spot. Because the, the barracks is only about 500 yards further up the street from where I was at McQuaid's. And the, the, the guards came down. And we had the army barracks in probably a quarter of a mile away. And they came, they came down. But the guards had come down. They were it was on the duty the Sunday. So, and the man held that was on it. He was, only, he was killed that day. He was only actually leaving. He was actually leaving a neighbour into the bus to get the bus back to Dublin. The express bus. He would never have been in. The town only for that, and he was unfortunately be parked beside the he parked beside the bar, and uh, that was their experience. It was frightening. It just re it just reengaged yourself where you lived, and like we were playing in the minor championship final, and you know we were all only eighteen, so it was it, it kept you focused on 
you, you know, what you had to do and to be aware of everything. And it left a very affected experience for the people of the town from then on because they were very aware of every car. It wasn't like it is now, there's a car for every single person. Uh, it was more families come in in cars, so they make one, one car per household. Everyone watched every car that was parked up. You had to know the number of the car. You become so alert. Oh, that was Mickey's car, that's Shane's car. As long as you were, you kept your focus all the time. And it took a long time that to wash off. But thankfully, uh, it was one experience and Mo what Monaghan went through and Dublin. And uh, it was unfortunate things, but as, as I said, these are times, thankfully, this is in the past. Yeah. And as a, a sportsman at the time, and you've been prominent enough with, with Monaghan as the years went by, what was it like watching Barry McGuigan and the fact that, you know, he, you know, he married a Protestant woman, Catholic himself. He was trying to stay away from from all those troubles and he you know there was even the lead up to the Pedroza fight where it was the slogan was leave the fighting to McGuigan what was it like I, I don't know if you know him well or whatever but what was that like I know Barry yeah but Barry McGuigan nice man he hit the superstardom uh, there's no question about it but he went through it tough he had he had a tough time and his father was a great inspiration too for him and like Barry uh, had his struggles but when he was there he was focused and delivering and it was it was strange to be married. Like I have uh, four of my family married, married uh, persons, and it was no mix. We mixed with mixed schools, so we're well used to it. Uh, Barry McGuigan, that time, being an international, and the fact that he lived in Clonus along the border, it, 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 added, it added to it. And uh, Barry, very focused on the fact that Monaghan won in 1985, the two teams. I mean, you look at the McWigan fight, like everyone was there went back to Clonus to see Barry McWigan come back, a world champion. And then Monaghan to take the cup back for the second time in 41 years. Then we wait seven more years, or uh, six more years till we had it again. It was a fantastic time for sport. And we didn't pass it. When you're in a community like ourselves in, in Casabini, it's a very mixed community, Protestant Catholic. And, Oh, got on unbelievably well together. And when I moved out from the town to, to Orem, not far from where Big Tom lives, it's a very strong uh, Protestant area. But the first people we moved out, the first people that came up to, to the one hadn't done in the house, the plowed the acre land we had, they plowed it all up for us. They were the first people that helped you all the time. And that was the mix we had in Monaghan. And when Barry McGuigan and that, it just ignited everyone, united everyone together. Everyone was following sport. And uh, McWigan, the, the fact that Barry won that title, and Con Train and Smith were there, there obviously their road club. Really, you know, it captivated what a person can do from a small area to be number one in the world and to be world champion. And the defend it was absolutely fantastic for him and the family and for the people at Clonus. Because, you know, growing up in Tipperary, it feels like we're dislocated from, you know, and you even mentioned it yourself, like someone from Mayo or Galway, they probably can't relate to what happened um, along the border and inside the border in, in other counties. So you were talking about how you mix well, the integration worked really well between yourselves and Protestants and they're welcoming you. So did you ever have discussions, you know, you as a Catholic with a Protestant talking about how agitators, you know, paramilitaries on both sides, how they're actually tr driving a wedge between ye and like, would you almost, do you ever get to a stage of being suspicious of somebody on the other side, even though day to day you get on really well? Funny enough, I was, uh, my strength would be the fact that I get on with other people and I would, I would never say I'd see the bad side of them, but I'd be wary at times, but in, the people I socialise with even now and go back then, there's nothing hidden. Everything I've done, people will know me before I met or know, knew of me. But all I, all they knew there was nothing there, only you know, going out to train. When we were in the back roads of Orem, out by Molly Ash Mountain, it was all controlled by partisan areas, big farms, the whole lot. They were used to a man running at 7 30 in a winter's night, totally black. He'd be taking in the cat for milk and next thing, oh Jesus, look at this man running. And I'd be running by him. And he'd jump out of the way and not, no one wouldn't see a fella coming running the roads at this time of night. You run up into the mountain, Molly Ash Mountain, and the exact same thing. People weren't used to seeing men running on the roads because it was a stronghold and Orm had a good team. There were different style of players. We were actually running, uh, when I was the only one out that day, 
but that wasn't his life. But we never seen, we were never a threat that way. But you'd be told if there was something suspicious in the road, you'd be notified. There's no question about it. And everyone, even when I went to the north and played uh, football across the border, you were always good when you were going to a club. You never went that far down. Like we did go down to Toronto. I remember the, the, the good team in the 60s and 70s, long before I was. I was going to the match all at home, but not across the border. They had some hurrying experience in those times. But in general, the GA people looked after each other and, and they knew if there was a tournament coming up, you'd be notified. They'd be saying, look, you might be delayed on the way down. Be, be here earlier. So the phones would be, not everyone had uh, with a phone, but the main... Liam McGraw was our mentor. He was from the solicitor's office. So there would be contact his either phone at all times. So there was no problem that way. Mm. But it, it was, uh, you're right in one thing when you see it there, because we played Mio in the, in, in the Centenary Cup in 84. And uh, we, we stopped to go over. And uh, when you stop in a pub to go over and you hear you from the north, to be watched that by and the way, just check and see he's not leaving that note say, the atmosphere changed in areas, especially when you see Mia. The difference that a husband and wife came in and a family, but the fact that three or four Mia goes in and might order a pint to be, to be sort of saying, Where are you from? and they'd mint the you speak, uh, How is uh, three pints there? and they'd mint the northern accent come in, everyone cocked their ears up, and uh, they're like good pheasants years ago. Only the, wood, the pheasant along the border would be hiding because they had to be taken of them. So that was the way it was then. Like that, that there, Shane. Is just... That must have been frustrating um, because, you know, you're, you're considering yourself as Irish as anyone else and then you have people cocking their ears just because your accent is, is more, well, it's Ulster. It is, but the troubles were very active. It was very active in the news at the time, Shane. The, the, the North really exploded badly in the 70s. And like Black Sheep? Uh, black Sheep? No, would be. We didn't cut ourselves like Black Sheep, but we knew... When the reaction by people, and uh, we end up having great fun, but it takes them a while. But to be very careful at the start, because remember, they were all listening to what's on social media. Well, it wasn't it was the news at that day. I know you'd say, well, we someone dropped, dropped the package in, and next the place goes up. All someone says, well, there was a package in the corner. So you don't go in with a bag with you. <laughs> you know, you put in a bag when you go to the pub. But that was the way it was then, and. As I said, thankfully, there were the memories that keeps you uh, just reminds you how thankful we are to get the stage we are in now. Mm -hmm.